morning again. Good morning. It's so nice to see you. This is sort of my second home here in, in Raleigh, and it's, and it's just an uh, honor to be with you today. Uh, my name is John. I've been a pastor for almost two decades now. It was a second uh, career for me. It was not the plan, and the plan is evolving every day. Um, but I wanted to... Uh, I'm going to share some things today. I'm not going to assume that we all agree politically, but you'll probably have a good idea where I stand as I speak because I think it's important in discussing what I'm going to discuss today. So the last time I was with you, we were in the middle of a presidential campaign. And at that time, the mere mention of the election in this room, there was an almost audible collective rolling of the eyes, right? There was this sense of there is something really strange happening. There is this almost ludicrous situation that we find ourselves in. And the outcome that we now have seemed impossible. The outcome that we now have to many in this room seemed like it was inconceivable. I want to talk to you about that today. <coughs> My family is here, and my wife, Jen, as you met earlier, is here. Now, Jen, if she's honest, she would tell you that I'm a pessimist. I don't like that term. <laughs> I like to say that I, I enjoy being prepared for the worst-case scenario. <laughs> I like to anticipate the most terrible outcome so that I am emotionally and practically ready for it. Right? Like, when it all hits the fan, I want to be wearing a poncho. That's my feeling. <laughs> this will often cause me to operate under the assumption that the worst case scenario is in fact inevitable and disaster is approaching. That's not fun to live with, right? Because whether it's the weather on our vacation or whether it's something to do with the kids, I'm always going to go to that most dire of circumstances. Now, I'm not proud of that. Maybe there are people like that in this room. Any pessimists in the room? Thank you. We're going to have a luncheon after and talk about why everyone else is wrong. Unless the lunch burns and we can't eat it. That's right. I'm imagining we're all going to get salmonella, so why do you even bother? So, so election day is approaching, and I'm doing what I do. I'm becoming very despondent and very negative. And so Jen, being the optimist that she is, she got out all the numbers and she got the tracking polls and she talked me down from the figurative ledge and she showed me why everything was going to be okay. And I knew she was wrong. <laughs> I said, get ready for the worst case scenario. And even though I said that, in my heart, I didn't believe it to be true. In my heart, I really didn't believe that this was possible. <coughs> And so election night came, and being prepared for the worst case scenario, I said to her, here's my plan. At 8 p.m., I'm going to take half an Ambien, <laughs> and I'm going to go to sleep. And you have permission to wake me up if we get any good news. The next thing I knew, I turned and looked at the clock, and it said 11.30 p.m., and I said, oh, no. I better grab the other half of the Ambien. <laughs> Matter of fact, I better grab two or three. So I got up, of course, and as Tuesday night became Wednesday morning and the reality started to set in, it began for us and for many people in this room a time of real and profound grieving. Not, not just some sort of figurative comparative grief, but real despair and loss at what felt like a death. A death of what the future of our country might be or the death of the president that we thought we would be welcoming or the, just the death of the feeling that we wanted to have on that day and in the days following. And we grieved and we still grieve things that were big and distant and things that were small and close. The, the things, we didn't just grieve the ascension of a person to office. We grieved the things that we experienced along the way. We grieved the things we learned about our country, <coughs> the, the divisions, the, the racism and the homophobia and the anti-Semitism and the misogyny that sort of rose up during those times. We, we grieved seeing that. We grieved the myth that was shattered of our, <coughs> our diverse coexistence. And we grieved our basic idea of home, of, 
America of church. So those are big things. Those, those are big picture things that we've been grieving over. Those are kind of large scale. <coughs> but we also we grieve the things that are small and close. We grieve the things that we learned about our neighbors and the things that we saw on social media from our friends and the things we heard over the table from family members and the stuff we saw on social media from pastors. And so everything feels touched by this. Everything feels affected. Nothing is untainted by this sadness that we have. And for those who are people of faith, it really throws a grenade into your belief system, doesn't it? I mean, you see unfolding this year the weaponizing of religion. And, you, and, and we saw high-profile evangelists and celebrity pastors perpetuating division. And we saw the way that God had been used to speak words that damaged people made in the image of God. So for many of us, our, our image of God has even been rattled. And it's okay to say that. Now, whether or not you're okay with the election results is not really the point here. The, but the point is you've probably still seen the discord. You've seen the fractures. You've seen the pain. There's almost no one right now in this country who feels really good about this country, about our future. So the question for us is, what do we do now? What do we do with this heavy sadness? What do we do with this thick sense of despair? What do we do with our grief? That's redemptive. What do we do that's productive, that's life-affirming? I lost my, my father three years ago really suddenly, and it was getting the phone call from my brother was like a, an atomic bomb of despair dropped on me. And you know what that's like if you've lost someone in that way. But I remember 30 minutes after my father died or so, after I had spoken to my family and we processed some of it, I ended up going to the store to get bananas. I remember going to the grocery store and picking up the bananas and thinking, your dad just died. Why the heck are you getting bananas? And I answered back, because we need bananas. And because I need to do something normal in the face of a real assault on what is normal for me. I think we need to all now figure out how to go and get bananas. Not go bananas. <laughs> how we need to craft a new normal now. How do we move forward and live and not let the event dictate what happens from here. And the way forward for us is the same way forward for anyone who grieves. You move. Ultimately, you have to move in response to death. You grieve and you move. You don't wait until you're healed to move. You move and you heal along the way. And you carry the sadness with you, and you carry the pain, and you carry the frustration, and you move with a limp, but you move because that is the only response of the living to something that's died. Those who are alive have the responsibility to keep living. And so that's what we're doing now. And living in these times means you become the active resistance to all the things that grieve you. Whatever it is that you see out there, or in your church, or in your family, or in this world, that are heavy on your heart, you become the active resistance to those things. You move in opposition to those things. Now that what is for many, for us, the worst case scenario, we have to move. Yesterday was the Women's March, and Felicia was... In D.C. And Laura and Elizabeth. Lo All right, yeah, if you were at the march in, in D.C., put up your hands. Amazing. They could probably barely raise their hands. They're so tired. Yeah. <laughs> and my 
my family and I attended the, the march here in Raleigh. And, you, you know, yesterday morning, I knew I should go. I knew it was the right thing to go. But I didn't really feel like I wanted to. And I was doing that thing where the bed feels really good and you're finding a lot of reasons to stay in it. But we went. And it was such a joy to be there because it, it was like a much needed injection of joy into our systems. Being physically around like-hearted people reminded you what hope feels like. See, when you grieve anything, you can forget that. You can forget what it feels like to feel joy. If you've lost someone you love, you know that feeling where all of a sudden you, you find yourself laughing and you, you realize you hadn't laughed in a long time. Well, yesterday, for many people, it was the first time we felt a sense of hope and lightness. When you grieve, sometimes you can be all in your head. You're trying to solve it. You're trying to fix it, right? And you're trying to get to a future that you can't get to through any other way but time. Sometimes we do that on social media. We just stay there and we go, I got to fix this. I got to figure this out. Sometimes you have to get out of your head and begin to move and to be with people. And so that was such a great thing for us to, to do yesterday. And here's the good news or the bad news for you. You're going to understand when I tell you this. The option now is that we become activists. Everyone in this room becomes an active response to the things that burden you. 90 million people didn't vote this year. They were passive. They were pacifists in that term. They thought that life would work itself out, that good things would prevail, that whatever they believed in would ultimately be proven true. And so for all of us, there are no options anymore. The option is not watch or do. We must do something. Now, your method of activism may vary. I have the spiritual gift of agitation. <laughs> I don't shy away from conflict. I invite it. Right? I don't avoid turbulence. I nurture it at times. But that may not be true for you. You may not be as much of a jerk as I am. You may be more gentle, or you may be quieter. You may be less comfortable with conflict, but your activism can still be powerful. For you, activism might mean sharing something on social media that you were hesitant to before. It might mean that you press into a conversation with someone when you used to walk away from it. It may mean hosting a party in your home like some friends of mine did last week. They host a weekly party where they write letters to their elected officials every week to remind them to be accountable. No loudness, no agitation, they just, they just do that work. Activism for you may be financially supporting an organization that you, whose work you always believed in but you never actually gave to. It might mean joining an organization, giving of your presence. Your activism might be to reach out to a Muslim community in this area. It might be to reach out to an organization that works with refugees. I don't know what your activism will look like, but here's the non-negotiable. We now have to live explicitly and clearly and boldly and continually in a way that affirms what we believe in and what we will not tolerate. This is what we need to do with this grief and this holy unrest. We need to live in a way so people know this is what I value, and this is what I will not tolerate. This is true for individuals in this room. It's true for this community of faith here. We decide what hills are worth dying on, and then we move to the hill. Because the worst part about grief is that everything feels changed. When you lose someone that you love or when you grieve anything, it's that loss of control. It's the things that I knew I don't know anymore. And so in those times when we all feel that, we need to ask ourselves two questions. The question that you start with is, what do I still know to be true? Do I still know that America's beauty is in its diversity? Do I still know that all people are inherently equal, regardless of their religion 
or their skin color, or their sexual orientation, or their place of origin? Do I still know that people are essentially good and trying to live this life well? Do I still know that sacrificial living and loving my neighbor as myself is the best thing about our faith tradition? Do I still know that black lives matter? You ask these questions and then you ask a second question. And the second question is, is my heart still beating? Because if it is, then you have everything you need to address the first question. You have everything you need to become an activist for the things that burden you. You are prepared to be the resistance in a time of grief. So we do these things. We move. We become personally invested. You'll excuse me, but I call it the lost art of giving a damn. You become personally invested in something that moves you enough to care. And then you become connected in a community of like-hearted people who care about those things too. And then you become politically engaged. That means not with politics only, but with the world outside of it. So you become personally invested. Connected in community that cares about what the things you care about. And then you become active in those things. And that's what we do. That's the work. It's really no mystery. When you grieve, you learn that death does not stop life. The living continues defiantly amongst those who are still here. So whatever you feel like you lost in November, whatever you feel like has died, you're still here. You have your voice and your circle of influence and your finances and your presence and it's been the response of people on the right to call those on the left snowflakes, as if they're fragile. And they obviously didn't realize how long my kids were off of school for a little bit of snow. <laughs> because snowflakes combined can do powerful things. And this is what community is. This is what we do. We gather like-hearted people together, and we change the face of the planet. I tell people that death is a date on the calendar, but grief is the calendar. So the campaign was an event. The election was an event. The Women's March was an event. But the way we respond is going to be the thing that changes us. The way we become the active resistance to the things that we grieve over. So I'm inviting you to a life of activism now in whatever way you can do that. I'm inviting you to be the resistance to the darkness in this world. In our church, we, um, in our home church in Raleigh, North Raleigh Community Church, we, someone will speak and then they'll say, what are you thinking? And I'm going to say that to you. What are you thinking about today? I'm Sue, and um, it's it is very profound for me. And by the way, we're not snowflakes; we're blizzard. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, my sister chose to leave this country. I don't know if she's coming back. She did that the Thursday. stopped painting, and she said, I can't live like this. Well, it's really hard. It's, thank you for sharing that. There's, there's so many disruptions in our lives, and so many relationships and people that we know, and in the work that I do, I cross paths with a lot of people's stories. And so you, you think about how heavy your, that one story is, and you magnify that by hundreds of thousands, and that's where we are. And all that we can do, all that you and I can do is respond to that, that sadness and the despair as personally as we can. And ultimately, for people who are creative, for me, that, that's part of my response. My, I write to resist, and maybe she'll come to that place, but right now, 
That's a that's a really frightening proposition. <coughs> I, I live in a world too with a with a lot of different viewpoints, and uh, just because of the political work I'm doing downtown, I'm actually learning. You know, I'm spending more time with the with the political right than I ever have before, and uh, they're not too high at hedras. Everybody thinks they're doing the right thing, right? right. So that helps a little bit. But um, and for me to say it in here, I know I'm taking a, a a risk at the you know at the reaction, but. I actually found out, you know, the six steps, you know, from heaven, uh, six uh, degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon. Yes. I'm now two degrees of separation from President Trump. Uh, it's a friend of mine uh, had met him, met him, and she he gave her a kiss, and there's a picture of this. It was it was it was sweet. But my point is that um, she's very involved in the Young Republicans, and uh, I want to say briefly what she said at the national convention she went to. The way they look at this, right, is that. They look at things like, like sexual orientation, skin color, all these sorts of things as ridiculous non-issues because they're still Republicans, right? They're still – it's all about the opportunity, and they're looking at it going, if everybody's not included in the pool, we're going to lose opportunity. My, my point is that I see a, a shift happening with the younger generation and seeing a lot of the older folks, right, as just this is stupid, right? This is stuff that's nonsensical. So I, I do also want to have some faith. That, that the things that are being done, I, 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 it's not a slide backwards, it's, it's, it's really rough. But, but as I see this stuff coming out of a 25-year-old's mouth, that this is the culture of what's coming up on the political right, I find it at least a little heartening to say, look, they're still who they are, but m maybe we're not going back into the dark ages. I mean, I just, I don't know, just, just another way to look at it. Thank you. So every single story in this room is different, let alone every person we're going to encounter. The problem what we do right now is we lump everyone into one story or another story. There's only two, and there's either right or wrong. The challenge for us is to affirm what we believe without dehumanizing the people who don't agree with what we believe. I think that you can do both. I think you can say to someone, here is where I am, and this is what I believe without attacking them. Now, they may feel attacked, but it's a challenge, so there are some times you need, I need to back away, give myself better words to say or more wisdom or time, but there are times where I have to say, no, if I don't say this, I'm being negligent. If I don't say this, it's not just that that person's going to get angry with me. If I don't say this, they're going to be okay, but the people who are suffering are going to still be suffering. Mm -hmm. So the way I explain it to people is sometimes I speak to the bully, not to change the bully. I speak to the bully so that the bully can hear that they matter enough to be spoken for. Mm -hmm. So you always have to weigh what is the personal cost of what I'm saying with the, the cost to someone else of my silence. And none of us know the balance of that. We fail every day, and you will. Um, no one, I mean, no one had a good Thanksgiving or Christmas this year, right? Many families were like, I don't, we were going to be like, let's just bag it and go, right? Um, but ultimately, we have to find and navigate a redemptive path through these messy relationships. And the tactics are... Make the most loving, honorable decision you could make, and then when you make a mistake, get up and do it again. There's just no way through this. We don't. We've never experienced this. This is unprecedented strife. I'm, I'm not a great devotee of all of the social media, but I've been looking at that since this election and seeing things I have never in my life before seen. Right. It is scary, but then what you do, like yesterday was a reminder, you know, uh, I'll just be frank and, and I hope I'm not embarrassing him, but we went out yesterday and my 11-year-old son said, I didn't know there were this many people who didn't like Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, we all need to be reminded that we're not alone in whatever path we're on. We can get locked in our heads and think, I'm the only one who's really burdened by this. I'm the only one who's grieving. And then you go, no. I'm not the only one, and the challenge is to take an event like yesterday and transform it into something that is sustainable, right, from that moment to a movement kind of thing. So yes, there is a lot to have despair about, but there's a lot to be expected and hopeful about because we are not silent victims unless we choose to be. 
Um, yes. That was something that I was struggling with yesterday on social media because there were so many people when we were saying we were going to the march, we were like, be safe, all of this, things are burning and Washington's falling and yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I really had to boil it down to the difference between, um, now I just lost the word, the difference between vandal and protester. Mm -hmm. Vandals will go out and burn a city because they're whatever. They're not organized. They're not with like-minded people. They're with small clumps of things. And when we come together in love, understanding, commitment, and actually take the steps that it takes to speak as one voice, not a whole lot of little right. ones, then we can get something done. Mm -hmm. And it's also, for me, as a person of faith, as a pastor, I see religion out there. I see Christianity, and I say, that's not what I grew up Believing That is not the Jesus who walked in and, and said, I'm here to set the... In fact, what did he say? He said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor and sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, set the oppressed free, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Like, that's what I know my faith tradition to be. And when I see that it's something is not and it's representing it, then I have to say, well, I need to respond. I need to say, you know what, that's not how it is. And so people can say, yes, there are vandals, or yes, you're, you're causing trouble. And then you can say, no, I'm going to show you. I'm going to demonstrate to you what activism looks like when it's redemptive. Um, yeah, Jim. I totally agree with her. Uh, day or two after the election, uh, we contacted Turn Team Canada uh, due to some degree charge over. And I am not professionally employed to be my retitled. It would be difficult unless we forced overturn the equality marriage. Mm -hmm. Then we would be refugees into Canada. Mm -hmm. And I felt like this is not my country anymore. My country is Pearl Harbor. No we gave. I'm just complaining. And Trump just destroyed it. I can't even call him up. You know. My emails, you will see, were not my pleasure. And I I'm more like Somebody tells me God sent him here. Okay, then what God is it? One that started wars or whatever? <laughs> because there's nothing about him that's good. Mm -hmm. This morning news, I turn up. We had not listened to the news since Thursday. Yeah. There wasn't anything about inauguration. Right. This is your post. And they're saying that we're millions of people that are in inauguration. <laughs> we're going to have free. We couldn't see it. Yeah. You know, we can't lie about feelings. Right, and it's gonna, it's, it's not gonna be easy, and it's gonna require perseverance, and it's gonna require withdrawing from time to be, to gain your sanity. You can't be fighting all the time, but I think when enough people do, some people can rest while the others are, and it's really about, I think, for the longest time, we just assumed things would go a certain way as far as civility, common decency, truth. Those things are not true anymore, and so now again, it's what is what do you know that's still true, and what's still true is the things that I value, and I have to find a way to affirm those things. And Abe, just tell me when to I know just tell me when we've gone too far. <laughs> nice question, Come on, right um, I've been an activist all my life. I, I marched against the Vietnam War. I've been to Washington. I've taken my daughter to Washington, and. Uh, you know, worked for the ACLU, for Planned Parenthood, and now I'm old and sick. I can't do those things anymore. And I'm trying very hard to figure out what I can't do to make a difference. I'm going to talk to Byra Song a couple of months ago. That was because I'm a musician. Can I just five nice. real quick? Just real quick. Please. At the march yesterday, and Laura, Laura and I talked about this a little bit on the way home. Michael Moore, we couldn't see any of those amazing speakers. I mean, there were all these celebrities, but we could hear. And Michael Moore, if you go to his website, because he's really like, like John, he's got this, you know, resistance outline going on. And so he was talking about being an introvert, and everybody's like, you're right. And, and, and I totally related to that, because I do feel like I'm an introvert. I think I suffer from social anxiety. So when he talks about getting active, you know, get politically active by, you know, 
not just joining the groups, but actually running for office, and that just makes me, you know, yeah. people say to me, you know, you, you're so political because you, I'm like, I hate politics. I absolutely hate politics. <laughs> but they don't believe me, but he said make a phone call every day, and that's what I said to Laura. I'm just, even the phone call makes me go, ugh, what do I, how do I say it? But there's scripts. So, right, Laura? Yeah. Right. Even if that, and that's what I'm going to start with, I'm just going to make these phone calls every day, every day, because everybody can do that every day. And, and you know, you have, the, you have your computer now, which is, a, mm -hmm. you have a voice, you have a direct line to things that you didn't have access to probably in the early days of your activism. What is your name? Loretta. Loretta. The other thing is, Loretta, I think that you could become an activism coach for people in this room uh, or for people online and say, here's how you do these things. Um, again, whatever your circle of influence is, you, you, have, you don't have to be physically out there you, to be there. Um, so I think that's something to think about for the next you know, few weeks. One other thing I just wanted to say, sure. this might sound flip, but I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, one of my favorite authors is Mark Twain. And he said, I've been through a lot of things in my life, some of which actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe everything we're you know, flipping out about won't actually happen. You know? I, I think a lot will. Well, but maybe some of them. Well, maybe we'll prevent some of it, too. That's right. You know, right. That's, the other that's thing. right. Yesterday happened, and it changed the dialogue. It changed the feeling. It changed. A lot of people are sitting around today going, okay, there is a way forward. We're not, life does not have to be dictated to us. Mm -hmm. um, Last question. Last one. Um, um, yes, right there in the blue. Um, one thing that is always acceptable is uh, to tell stories. And if you can tell someone a story about uh, a Muslim friend or a Hispanic immigrant or someone who's undocumented, mm -hmm. and you say it nice and quietly as if, you know, this is an important, and you just pass it along as a story, It definitely gives you inroads to many. There will be people over here who say, I don't really care about anyone's story. Those are people you're never going to reach anyway, but there are, that's the other part about this. There's a huge <laughs> section of people, regardless of their politics, who are genuinely decent, loving people trying to do what they believe they are called to do by either God or their moral convictions. So I'll answer your question in the back after this. I'm sorry we're out of time, but um, thank you for your, for your time and... Um, just for a second, let's take 30 seconds and just breathe. find the things that burden you, and then may you find a way to work for those things, toward goodness, toward healing, toward justice, and may you lean on God and good people and wisdom to do that with as much dignity as you can. <laughs>